Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cal Lopez, and I am the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth State Coordinator. And we are about to start our applicant webinar. I just wanted to make sure that everybody could hear me today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I am joined today, my co-pilot today for our presentation is Monica Brewer, who is our gifted and talented state coordinator. I know we have already gotten a lot of questions about whether this webinar will be recorded. And yes, we are recording today's presentation and we will uh, talk more about where and when it will be posted. So uh, we're going today we will cover information about the 2021-2022 uh, Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth Grant. This is the applicant webinar. And the information that we'll be covering today, oh, let me get here. So this webinar is designed to support applicants for the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth Grant. Um, this webinar will provide a general overview of the request for application components, resources related to developing a, and I'm gonna refer throughout the presentation, TECHI grant, which is the abbreviation for our program, information about the eligibility of applicants and students to be served by the program. Um, and so in today's presentation, we will review the following TECHI grant uh, request for application components. We are gonna go over timelines, applicant eligibility and funds available, program guidelines, application part one and required attachments, review criteria and scoring, and the frequently asked questions or FAQ process. So I apologize, we're having a little difficulties here. There we go. So we will refer many times throughout the presentation to the TEA grants opportunities page. And in this section, we're gonna discuss the request for application components. All the TECHI RFA documents are posted on the TEA grants opportunities page. Applicants should review and carefully follow the instructions to complete and submit their grant application packet. As you can see here, I have um, included a screenshot um, that can be found on the TE Grants Opportunities page of the application and support information. And so here in this box, you will find the notice of intent to apply, which we'll be covering today during the webinar, our program guidelines, our application part one, and the three required attachments for this application. You'll also find an eligibility list and reviewer information form. We encourage you to check the TEA Grants Opportunities page regularly for updated information, such as this is where our FAQ document will be posted. This is where the recording of the applicant webinar will be posted. And if there are any corrections to the program guidelines, they will be posted with an errata. So this is a very important page. I wanted to go ahead and provide you a screenshot of where you can see all the information that you will need to complete the application. Um, in addition to that, the program guidelines and the general physical guidelines will provide all the requirements and expectations for the program and the management of the grant. The application part one, which we will cover um, in future slides, is a fillable PDF that will be completed and submitted by each applicant along with the required attachments. And I wanna stress there are three attachments and they are all required for the application. Reference documents are also provided to help applicants determine eligible LEAs and ESCs for the program and projected grant funding amounts. So please check the grants opportunities page often for any updated or new information. And I wanna stress again, this is where our FAQ document, the recording of today's webinar and erratas. And so an errata will explain any item that may be replaced or changed within a given document. So here on our next slide, we're gonna go ahead and discuss the purpose of the 2021-2022 TEHCY grant 
program. So the purpose is to provide LEAs and ESEs additional capacity to provide equitable opportunities and outcomes for McKinney-Vento students by promoting school stability, facilitating enrollment and identification, improving student attendance and academic outcomes. Our goal is to fund LEA and ESE grant projects that will implement a comprehensive approach to increase attendance, on-time promotion, and graduation to fund projects that will develop innovative academic programs and support services that will allocate funding to support McKinney-Vento staff to carry out these projects that demonstrate a direct connection between proposed grant goals, objectives, activities, and use of funds to address the unique needs of students experiencing homelessness. And lastly, projects that will leverage grant funding with other LEA, state, federal, and community resources to address the specific needs to drive student outcomes. Examples of supplemental educational services. This is a question that we have received for the, for the webinar today. Are before and after school programs, summer programs, and other programs during intersessional breaks. So for example, a STEM camp, providing tutoring, uh, developing a mentoring program. Techie grant programs should increase equity by providing high quality programs, activities, and services to again, to support equitable opportunities and outcomes for our students. The proposed programs should also address the learning gaps that may occur due to the high mobility that our students experiencing homelessness face, along with any COVID-19 related challenges or learning slide, in addition to, to summer slide or learning loss that impacts our students experiencing homelessness at a much higher rate as compared to their non-homeless counterparts. So here on this slide, we wanted to give you um, a grant overview. So the Techie Grant is a discretionary competitive grant program that provides individual subgrant awards to local education agencies and to education service centers. Awards are selected, awards are selected every three years, and grant awards amounts are approximately for $7.7 .7 million and will range from $7,500 to $375,000. I did want to stress that LEAs must have a projected grant amount and ESCs of a minimum of $7,500. The cap is $375,000. The current grant competition is for the 2021-2022 school year, and it also includes continuations for 2022, 2023, 2023, and 2024 school years. Project funding is subsequent on USDE grant awards for this program and a non-competitive continuation application would be required. So again, this competition is for the 2021, 2022 school year, but it is a three-year grant competitive cycle. So those LEAs and ESCs that are awarded this grant would be eligible for funding for two more years. Um, our goal is to maintain the funding that is provided in year one, but that is all based on the grant that we receive from the U.S. Department of Education on a yearly basis. So it's always our goal to maintain the funding. If we do receive additional funding, we will provide increases throughout the three-year cycle and applicants would need to comp complete a non-competitive continuation application. We've also indicated in previous information that we anticipate approximately 80 grants that will be awarded to both LEAs and ESCs. We have received a question that, um, is the ESC considered the applicant and the grantee? And the question is yes. So if an ESC does have a shared service arrangement with 10 districts, that is not 11 grants. It is one grant awarded to the ESC with the shared service arrangement. 
Here on this next slide, you will see a screenshot of the TECHI grant timelines. Again, this information can be found on the TEA grants opportunities page. And I just wanted to highlight some important dates. So next Wednesday, April 14th is the last day to submit FAQs. And we will go over that information in some future slides. We also wanted to let you know that Tuesday, April 27th is the due date for notice of intent to apply. Tuesday, April 27th is also the due date for reviewer information. And Tuesday, April 27th is the date that the FAQ will be posted. We will cover all of this information as we throughout the webinar. And then lastly, the due date for this application is May 18th by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. Again, you can uh, review this timeline. It is included in the program guidelines, which you can access on the TEA Grants Opportunities page. So before I go on to the next slide, I just wanted to share with everyone that after we go through all the slides, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will be reviewing them and providing um, the answers at the end of the webinar. So we will be addressing questions, but it will be at the end. So I just kind of wanted to remind everyone about that. Okay. So here on this next slide, we're gonna discuss eligibility. Who is eligible to apply for the TECHI grant? So eligible applicants include local education agencies, and so we refer to LEAs throughout the presentation, and that includes um, our school districts and our open enrollment charter schools, and then our education service centers or ESCs. LEAs are required to join a shared service arrangement or an SSA if their project grant amount is less than 7,500. Applicants can apply individually or part of a shared service arrangement, but applicants are not permitted to apply as both. So we're gonna talk here more, a little more about shared service arrangements. So only ESCs are allowed to act as a physical agent of an SSA. Each SSA must have a minimum of three member districts. There is no maximum number of member districts and SSA member districts are required to participate for the full three-year grant cycle. LEAs are required to join an SSA, an SSA if their projected grant amount is less than 7,500, which equates to having identified less than 69 homeless students. Projected grant amounts are calculated by the total number of identified students during the 2019-20 school year times $110, which is our funding allocation. I also wanted to share that ESCs are the physical agent and also considered the grantee as part of a shared service arrangement. Here on this next slide is a screenshot of the TECHI grant eligibility list, which can be found on the TEA grants opportunities page. Again, this list was determined by the 2019-20 um, PEMS data, Public Education Information Management System data of identified students. It does include um, the name of the LEA, which is sorted by region, the total LEA enrollment, the total economically disadvantaged count, the count of students who are considered economically disadvantaged, number of homeless students who were identified during the 2019-20 school year, the TECHI projected grant amount, and then it also includes the LEA percentage of homeless students, of homeless students who were coded and identified as economically disadvantaged, and the overall percentage of economically disadvantaged students. And so this is information that is very important um, when we discuss our priorities for funding. Next, we are gonna go ahead and go over the program guidelines. 
So the program guidelines can be found on the grants opportunities page. Applicants should review the detailed information regarding program specific assurances, statutory requirements, TEA program requirements, activities and use of funds, performance measures, scoring and review. Some additional information that is also included in the program guidelines is information about travel um, and information about field trips and scoring and review, as I indicated. So the program guidelines will map out all the information you need to complete your application packet. Here on the next slide is a screenshot of the application part one. So within the application part one, components that will be covered are application information. And so we want to stress that when you do provide the primary and secondary contact, that will be the names, emails, and phone numbers of who we will be uh, providing information throughout the three-year grant cycle um, for this program. Certification and incorporation. It also covers shared service arrangements. Um, it discusses identifying and addressing needs, looking at and providing your SMART goal, measurable progress, project evaluation and modifications, statutory and program assurances and equitable access and participation. So I did wanna cover a few of the components. So in your part one application is where you will have the opportunity to list up to three quantifiable needs as identified in your needs assessment and that these program funds will address. Be sure to clearly describe your plan for addressing each need. Use data to assist in developing a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely, or as we refer to a SMART goal and benchmarks that are in alignment with the statutory and program goals and objectives of this grant. A few things to keep in mind. How can you use your SMART goal to help design your proposed program? What data is needed to properly build out your grant programs, activities, and services to meet your benchmarks and SMART goals? We did receive a question prior to the applicant webinar um, regarding the availability of character space within the application and whether the application could be manipulated. And so in order to maintain a fair competition, the application is designed with a fixed answer space that is limited to the visible text boxes provided. So you cannot manipulate the application um, because only the visible text in the boxes will be submitted to the reviewers during this competition. Here on the next slide, is the last page of the application part one component. Here is where you will go ahead and request your grant funds. And they are broken down by payroll costs, professional <clears throat> and contracted services, supplies and materials, other operating costs and capital outlay. List all allowable grant related activities you're requesting grant funds. Include the amount budgeted for each activity. <coughs> Group similar activities and costs together under the appropriate heading. During negotiations, you will be required to budget your planned expenditures on a separate attachment that will be provided by TEA. These expenditures will be reviewed and modified if necessary during the grant negotiations. So we had received a question saying, Cal, where is the detailed budget tables? That information will be provided to you once the grant has been awarded and we go through the negotiation process. This is a high level overview of your request for grant funds. <clears throat> so here, as we move forward, we're gonna go ahead and go over our statutory and TEA program requirements. So the first statutory program, uh, statutory requirement is to provide a description of your proposed grant activities, programs, and services, how they address the identified needs and promote equitable access to program services needed to improve academic outcomes for students experiencing homelessness. 
resources and systems that will be implemented to support target goals and outcomes, and how progress milestones and observable results will be documented. In addition to that, for statutory requirement one, there is a required attachment, which is the Techi grant activity chart. In the chart, you'll describe the grant activities, programs, and services that will be provided to address the unique needs of students experiencing homelessness. Indicate which quantifiable or identified need these grant funds will address. The information provided in this chart should be in alignment with your SMART goal you have identified for this application and related to the student outcomes that are consistent with the purpose of the grant. You are limited to 10 grant activities. When completing the attached grant activity chart with the requested information, please describe the activity and provide the target student outcomes. And within that description, indicate how the grant activity program or service will be provided, approximately how often it will occur, and what are the anticipated student outcomes. For the section that indicates position responsible, do not include names of personnel, just include the staff position responsible for this activity or program. Include which of the three identified needs this project will address, and include the projected funding amount and percentage of grant funds to be utilized. Also, when completing this section of the application, I want you to think about four things. What resources will be used to support this project? And when we're talking about resources, you should be thinking about local resources within your district, your charter school, within your ESC, resources within the local community, and how that in partnership with grant funds will be used to support this project. When we're looking at activities, what are the main things this project will do or provide? We also want you to be reflective and to describe how many and what sort of observable and tangible results will be achieved by these proposed grant activities, programs, and services. And what will occur as a direct result what activities and outputs, what change in knowledge, skills, or behavior will occur due to, the, to this information. We're gonna go ahead and move forward to statutory requirement number two. So here we are asking applicants to provide a description of the extent to which the application reflects coordination and collaboration, proposed use of funds, um, will facilitate the enrollment, identification, and educational outcomes of homeless children and unaccompanied youth. The extent to which the applicant will promote meaningful involvement of parents or guardians. And the extent to which homeless children and unaccompanied youth will be integrated into the regular education program. So you can include a list of agencies, community, and LEA collaborators, and a brief, brief description of the proposed co-activities that will support implement, implementation of the proposed grant activities, programs, and services. Some examples of collaborators or local collaborators are local nonprofits, shelters, food pantries. So that will vary from area to area and region to region. On the next slide, we're gonna go ahead and briefly cover statutory requirement number three. So statutory requirement number three also requires an attachment. So for this section, you will need to identify the types, intensity, and coordination of services to be provided in coordination with your Title I Part A homeless reservation, including the process to review and develop the LEA's plan for coordinating services to support eligible homeless children and unaccompanied youth using the Title I Part A Homeless Reservation. In addition, how the LEA determines its reservation amount for services to support homeless children and unaccompanied youth. That is the box within the application. In addition to that, applicants need to complete and submit the Title I Part A and McKinney-Vento attachment. Within this chart, 
you must indicate what was your actual Title I Part A homeless reservation for the 2019-20 school year. What was that reservation amount and a summary of the use of the funds, activities, and staffing that were provided? In the second line, you need to provide what is the actual Title I Part A homeless reservation for the current year, for 2020-21. And again, what are the use of funds allocated for, what activities and staffing? So for statutory requirement three, you must complete the information A and B in the application and complete this attachment. And for the last statutory requirement, number four, this is also has a required attachment. So we want you to provide a description of the established LEA processes to develop, review, and revise current LEA policies and procedures to ensure that its proposed grant activities, programs, and services will not isolate or stigmatize homeless children and unaccompanied youth. Within this chart, there are several components of McKinney-Vento, which asks if you do have a current policy or procedure and you either indicate yes or no. For the dispute resolution process, which all LEAs should answer yes to this, you're also required to provide an attachment of your local board policy and any attachments that support the dispute resolution process. So for statutory requirement number four, you must complete that box in application part one. You must complete and submit this attachment of the McKinney-Vento policies and procedures, and then also include the attachment of your local board policies and attachments that support the McKinney-Vento dispute resolution process. So now we're gonna go ahead and move forward with our TEA program requirements. Before we start, as part of our overall goals and objectives for this grant, we are providing this TECHI program implementation and levels of service and support. LEAs need to develop processes of procedures, reports, and systems to element, implement all three levels of services and support. Grant funds can be utilized for dedicated McKinney-Vento staff to support their grant programs, activities, and services. So as you can see here on this chart, we consider level one of program implementation is school enrollment, McKinney-Vento identification, and assessment of services that occurs during the intake process. Level two would then be PEAMS coding of homeless students. And so we want to ensure that there are systems and processes in place to ensure that students are coded in a timely manner upon identification at the beginning, during, and throughout the school year, and that there is a process to verify that the coding has occurred. Also, we must keep in mind that if a student has only been identified and enrolled in your district for a few days, they must be coded. Implementation of services. So is there a system to ensure that the student was coded and receiving free breakfast and lunch program services, that they are receiving the school of origin services that they have requested, or any other type of general education or special population services? So if they were discussed at the intake, is there a way to review what was discussed at the intake and have those implementation of services? And lastly, overall McKinney-Vento program monitoring. Is there a process to monitor your student identification and enrollment on a regular cadence? Level three would then cover your progress monitoring. So this would include monitoring attendance, grades, credits, McKinney-Vento services, general education services, and special program services throughout the year. This would be tied to regular data tracking of your students. Something to keep in mind is how can you advocate for your students if you are not tracking them? There should be a process in place to review and monitor program and student data on a regular cadence. This includes, includes regular monitoring of student coding, attendance, grades, credits earned, 
and the implementation of the services listed in this box. These are the three foundational levels to support program implementation. And this is something that you should keep in mind as you address the next four TEA program requirements in your grant application. TEA program requirement number one. We are asking you to provide a description of the process and procedures that are utilized to enroll, identify, and provide all three levels of TECHI program services and support for homeless children and unaccompanied youth who are entering or returning to their schools from summer or holiday break. How are we ensuring that there are processes for immediate enrollment identification and services as students transition from breaks? Experiencing homelessness after the school year has started are not currently enrolled or attending schools. And right now, this is a pivotal key part of information. Um, we do know that students experiencing homelessness have a higher rate of being uncontactable and have not been in regular attendance of our schools since we have gone to both a split between virtual and in-person learning. What kind of systems are in place to ensure that we are tracking students that may have dropped out and to recover them? Are eligible for early childhood and pre-kindergarten pre programs. For the next TEA program requirement number two, we are asking you to provide a description of the annual McKinney-Vento professional development plan that is currently in place to increase awareness, support enrollment and identification, and increase staff capacity to respond to the unique educational needs of homeless children and unaccompanied youth. We are asking you to include dates, duration of training, who is trained or will be trained, and a summary of the training content and evaluation process. Include both ex external and internal professional development activities. So we did want to provide some guidance. We did receive a question about uh, guidance for ESCs that are providing a shared service arrangement. So when we are asking for this professional development plan, it should be what are the ESCs should include their annual training plan and what training they provide to their districts. They can include any monthly or quarterly meetings in which they have guest speakers or additional trainings or meet with their districts within their region to help provide technical support or any other sorts of professional development. TEA program requirement number three. So within this section, we are asking for a description of how your, the proposed grant activities, programs, and services will address the unique academic needs and support equitable outcomes for elementary homeless children and youth. So I wanna stress this section is specifically for students, elementary students. We want you to include a timeline, milestones, strategies and or systems that will be utilized to implement academic progress monitoring, interventions and services to support attendance and engagement, on time promotion, coordination of targeted services for homeless children and unaccompanied youth who have been identified or are receiving other special programs. For example, special education, English learners and gifted and talented. Um, also provide information about bridging programs, assessment interventions, discipline, tutoring, and any other type of supplemental academic programs or other program services. For TEA program requirement number four, this is specific to secondary homeless children and unaccompanied youth. So this would be our middle and high school students. We are requesting a similar description regarding the proposed grant activities, programs, and services that will address the unique academic needs. And we want you to also, again, include timelines and milestones and strategies that will be utilized to implement academic monitoring interventions and services. Uh, many of the components are similar, but some that I would like to highlight is a uh, transcript review for appropriate full or partial credit, credit recovery or credit repair services, um, four-year cohort graduation rates, graduation of all homeless students, and that includes those graduating within their cohort, continuers or early graduates, college and career readiness programs and support services, post-secondary transition plans. So we, again, this is very specific to secondary homeless children and unaccompanied youth. 
So now that we have we have gone through all the statutory and program requirements, I did want to touch base on a few other items that are included in the program guidelines and application, and that is activities and use of funds. So historically, the use of McKinney Vento grant funds was focused on basic needs such as hygiene, clothing, and grocery items. For this grant competition, hygiene, clothing, and grocery items can only be purchased when a natural disaster occurs or due to the ongoing impact of COVID-19. These are examples of providing extraordinary or emergency assistance to enable homeless children and youth to attend school and participate fully in school activities. We encourage you to refer to the unallowable use of funds on page 19 of the program guidelines, which provides more information about the payment for emergency groceries, hygiene items, and clothing items that are limited to these two circumstances. In addition, we did receive questions about the purchase of gift cards, and they are also unallowable. We also received a question about purchasing food for a food pantry, and that would also be unallowable given that there are these two uh, circumstances in which these purchases would be okay. We know at times there may be some unforeseen circumstances, but those would be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So the purpose of this application, these are the two circumstances in which funds could be utilized for these basic needs. And again, they are limited to approximately 15% of the annual grant budget. In addition to that, we also encourage you to review all the allowable activities use of funds. So they are covered on multiple pages of the program guidelines. So please take the time to review all of them as you complete your application. Here in this section, we're gonna briefly review the Techie Grant LEA performance measures. So the applicant agrees to collect data and report on the following mandatory performance measures. The number of identified homeless children and youth, attendance rates, promotion rates, state assessment scores, and graduation rates for homeless children and unaccompanied youth. LEAs and ESEs need to establish a process and reports to monitor program data throughout the school year and the period of the grant to ensure that these mandatory performance measures truly reflect the impact of the proposed grant activities, programs, and services. Program measures are designed to monitor academic performance, school attendance, and engagement. Monitoring performance measures data every grading period should be a minimum expectation for the Techie Grant Program. We are now going to move forward to scoring and review. So for the purpose of this grant, we have a standard review criteria, which you can reference in the general and physical out guidelines, applicable to grants published on or after May 1st of 2020. So for the identified and addressed needs in your application, there are 10 possible points. Measurable goals and programs, an additional 10 possible points. Project evaluation and modification, there are five possible points. Statutory and program requirements are worth 25 possible points. And your budget, there are 10 possible points. So there is a total of 60 possible points for this grant application. In the program guidelines, we have indicated that there is priorities for funding. Applications that receive 70% of the 60 points available will have an additional five points awarded for those LEAs and ESCs with an economically disadvantaged percentage of 75% or higher. And this information can be referenced on the eligibility list. I did wanna stress that this for this grant program, there is no specific review criteria for this program and that is referenced in the program guidelines. And we also received a question about how the uh, priority points will be calculated for ESC SSA applications. The formula to cal calculate the priority points for ESC SSA members is that we will take the total number of economically disadvantaged students for that count. And so for example, let's say you have five member districts with 1,167 um, students that are considered economically disadvantaged. And that will, the denominator will be the total number 
of the LEA enrollment of those member districts. So out of those five districts, the total enrollment is 2,132 of those five member districts. So we would get the 1,167 divided by the 2,132, which comes to an economically disadvantaged percentage of 54.73. So then this ESC would not be eligible for the additional five points. So we wanted to go ahead and address this. For more information, you can review pages 17 and 18 of the program guidelines. And we will be incorporating an errata to the program guidelines to go ahead and address this question and incorporate this answer that was provided. So you will refer back to the grants opportunities page. There will be an errata to the program guidelines, which will clearly articulate how we will average this out for ESC SSA applications. Here on the next slide, we're gonna go ahead and discuss our frequently asked questions process. So applicants must submit their written questions no later than Wednesday, April 14th by 8 p.m. to the Homeless Education at tea.texas.gov email address. Any questions received after 8 p.m. Central Time on April 14th will not be answered. The FAQ document will be posted <clears throat> on Tuesday, April 27th on the TEA Grants Opportunities page. So again, after this presentation, if you have any additional questions as you're completing your application, please submit them by next Wednesday, April 14th, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time to the Homeless Education at tea.texas.gov email box. Here on our next slide, we're gonna go ahead and discuss the notice of intent to apply. So this is a screenshot of the document that you can find on the TEA Grants Opportunities page. Remember, it's where um, all the information, where the program guidelines, the application is listed, it is in that section. And so this form is a completion and submission of the intent to apply document is not mandatory. However, it will assist TEA anticipate the volume of applications and prepare for the competitive review process. So applicants who do not file the notice are still eligible to apply for the grant. I wanna stress it is not required, but we highly encourage you to do that so we can anticipate the number of applications we may be receiving and to help prepare for the review process. Submissions of the intent to apply document in no way obligates an applicant to submit an application. So if you do submit a notice of intent to apply, you are not obligated to move forward with the application process. We ask that you submit this document as soon as possible, but no later than Tuesday, April 27th. And if you have any questions, you can direct them directly to the Competitive Grants Unit at competitivegrants at tea.texas.gov. Again, for more information, you can review page 16 of the program guidelines. And this document is a live document located in the application and support information section on the TEA grants opportunities page for this grant. Here on the next slide, we're gonna go over reviewer information and reviewer information form. I wanna let you know that this information can be found on page 17 of the program guidelines. It is located on uh, the TA Grants Opportunities page in the same section, the application and support information, um, which houses again, the program guidelines, the application uh, the eligibility list. Applicants are asked to nominate at least three and up to five individuals to serve as reviewers for this grant competition. By submitting these names, the applicant ensures that these individuals are willing and able to review applications during the review period of June 4th through July 8th of 2021. These individuals have not, should have not been paid to prepare any portion of this grant application. These individuals should also have McKinney-Vento subject matter expertise and are also qualified to, share, to serve as a peer reviewer. So we are looking for reviewers that have experience in working with students experiencing homelessness, are familiar with the McKinney-Vento program, <clears throat> in an educational setting, and also if you are familiar with reviewing uh, grant applications process. 
So uh, please ensure that these individuals, that you have notified these individuals of their nomination to serve as a peer reviewer. Um, submit these forms no later than Tuesday, April 27th. You can direct any questions to the competitive grants unit at competitivegrants at tea.texas.gov. Uh, detailed information on the peer review and scoring process will be sent to those reviewers who are selected to serve. And we're gonna go ahead and come here. So this is my program contact information. Again, my name is Cal Lopez and I am the Texas Education for Homeless Children and Youth State Coordinator. Um, please refer any FAQ questions to the homeless education at tea.texas.gov email. And we're going to go ahead and move forward to our Q&A. And so as we're evaluating the Q&A, there are some questions that I did receive prior to the webinar. And so I wanted to go ahead and address them at this time while Monica and I look over the questions that came in. So first, one of the questions that I received was um, about approved out-of-state travel. So within the program guidelines, it does indicate that the only approved out-of-state travel costs that may be funded through this grant is attendance to the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth or NACI Conference. In addition to that, I have received several questions about tutoring. Um, so I wanted to share with you, when it comes to tutorers or providing tutoring, it's been asked if homeless students can be uh, <clears throat> can be put in with other student groups and have that tutor, for instance, provide tutoring for five students who are not homeless and one student who is not. And so one thing to keep in mind with tutoring services is that you have to be careful to uh, ensure that you are going above and beyond and to supplement whatever tutoring serv services are available and provided to all students, meaning students who are not homeless. So if there is a tutor providing services for five students who are not homeless, and then we go ahead and include one homeless student, that should not be paid for out of grant funds because that would be a comparable service if it's open to all students. So that is something to be keeping in mind. What are the comparable services being provided to our students when it comes to tutoring? And if it's not specifically for students experiencing homelessness, what is the quality and the expectation? How are you going to pay for that staff? How are you going to prorate their time? There's a lot of questions that you have to step back and look at. And so with, it, with these funds, this is an opportunity to provide services that supplement what is already available for all students to help support our homeless students that have, have experienced a lot of learning loss or have a lot of learning gaps. And so we need to ensure that you are providing tutoring services that are best interest of the student. We also have to keep in mind about confidential settings. And again, do these services meet the unique needs of students experiencing homelessness? In addition, we've also asked about online tutoring programs. When we get that question, the first thing we're gonna ask you is, how do you provide tutoring for all other students? Has this tutoring service been evaluated? Has it been approved by your financial office? What are the components that are being covered? Are they in the alignments with the TEKS and supports that the student needs? So we ask you to reflect back on all that information and to always remember, is it comparable? Are you supplanting? Is it supplemental? Is it going above and beyond? Is it meeting the student's individual needs? Okay. We've also received questions about purchasing computers. So students and families uh, can have a separate space to complete lunch applications, college applications, FAFSA applications, job applications. And the response would be no. We know that at campuses, there are computers and technology available to both students and families to complete this information. Again, this would be considered supplanting. So when there's already services and technology available, if you did not have this grant, how would these students and families be you know, completing this information and doing these activities? 
So that is always a self-reflective self question to provide. Okay, Monica, those were the questions that I wanted to cover that we did receive prior okay. to the applicant webinar. Okay. Uh, and this one is pretty much based on the eligibility list and is the cap amount that has been posted uh, for each district can apply or can a district apply for funding amount higher than what has been projected? So the eligibility list has a projected amount. Is the cap amount for which the district can apply or can a district apply for funding? No. So the cap is the cap. So if you're, ca if you're at the $375,000 cap, that is the highest amount you can apply for. This applies both to LEAs and ESCs. Okay. What are the questions we have? I see a Go ahead. Uh, question. Um, can grant funds be used to cover substitute costs for educators attending professional development and or trainings tied to homeless awareness training? So that's a really good question. Um, I will go ahead and double check with grants. I'm going to have a feeling that the answer is no to cover substitute costs. That is our preliminary answer um, because for if a training is provided about McKinney Vinto, it should be provided, for instance, at a staff meeting that occurs before or after school. It shouldn't be occurring in which you would have to come and incur a cost for a substitute teacher. So that's why we would go ahead and say no. But this is a really good question. And there are some questions that are here today that we'll most probably also include in our FAQ. So when we're providing professional development, it should happen when all staff are available and should not incur a substitute cost. Okay. All right. Uh, so if they are a participating as an SSA, do they still need to fill out an application or send out an intent to uh, apply? If we are participating in SSA, do we need to fill out the intent? So if you are participating in an SSA, it would be the ESC who would go ahead and fill out uh, the application and the intent to apply. Because the ESC would be the applicant, the grantee, and the fiscal agent. So you need to work with your ESC um, in participating in that SSA and they will complete the paperwork. Okay. Uh, the next one is kind of a similar, but I'm gonna start with one and go to the next. So can we purchase stress tools? I would say just from that generalized question, the answer would be no, um, because I would definitely need more information on what is a stress tool. Um, if it's like a, a widget, a fidget item, that would be a no. There is ways to receive donations for some stress tools. Uh, and here's a follow-up, a similar kind of type of question. So for the 21-22 grant, uh, did you state school, uh, state school supplies, clothing, and hygiene items can only be purchased if a natural disaster has been declared? So I would redirect you back to the program guidelines. It clearly uh, provides more information that during the 21-22 grant, the purchase of clothing, hygiene, and food can only be purchased if a natural disaster has been declared by the Office of the Governor or as a federal dis declared disaster area. So there is more guidance in your program guidelines. We did not include school supplies. School supplies can be purchased with your grant program. Um, it's not tied to any specific situation there. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and um, address a couple more, Monica, I see, unless you have more for me. Yeah, there, there was a few that came in, and then I was looking. I pulled your chat also. Uh, but yeah, you can go either way. OK. Um, so I am looking here at one that was a question, and it was, will the amounts be adjusted based on the 21, 2022 snapshot? And the answer is no, where the eligibility lists are based on the 2019-20 PEANS list. 
So we will not be making any adjustments during the competition. Um, So the question is, is what's going to happen if we don't submit any reviewers or don't find any reviewers? I believe nothing is gonna happen. We just highly encourage you to do it if possible. If you're not able to do the three to five, uh, submit what you can. And so oftentimes for reviewers, you may consider some counselors um, or other professional school staff, administrators, other uh, admin staff that may have experience, state and federal program uh, directors or coordinators, so be reflective within your district, your LEA, um, and look at uh, leadership that may have experience with McKinney Vento. So, so the question, go yeah. ahead. Uh, what form do they use to list their SSA members? I think we got yes. that a couple of ways too, yeah. Yes, so that should be included in the application. I will go back and revisit that and we'll, we'll get back to you. I see who it's from. Um, so we will go ahead and work with grants on that document if you're not seeing it. I will go double check the program guidelines and look at that list or what will be needed to complete that. I believe in the program guidelines, it's already there with a few um, spaces. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and provide you that additional guidance. And then question, what is the needs assessment referred to in section four? So yes, so in section four, it clearly articulates that you should have a needs assessment process within your district. Um, there's usually one with Title I that's already established. So you should be looking at what are the services and supports and items provided to students experiencing homelessness and identify the gaps, the needs, um, and they should be academic focused for the purpose of this grant. So I see some questions about, will there be cost associated with upcoming mandatory trainings? Um, and so we do not have that information at this time. So we would encourage you to allocate some funds for that. Um, we have not established the trainings that will be needed to attend besides the Techi Summit, which will occur uh, next year after this grant, that information will be provided to awardees um, after the grant competition has occurred. Um, a question about school uniforms. So we do see school uniforms as a school supply and we know that it is necessary, but we always encourage the district to first utilize any type of donations or other funding sources before grant funds are used to purchase school supplies. A couple of questions from earlier in the chat. So if a district has a summer school program, such as you mentioned earlier uh, in meeting the eligible uh, activities, if the district offers summer school programs, can McKinney-Vento funds be used for McKinney-Vento students who do not qualify for the district's summer program? Okay, so I'm looking for that one again. Uh, very early on. Very early on. I'll copy it and put it in the chat for you. Okay, thank you. I do see one that says, where can I find a copy of statutory requirement number two? And it is listed in the program guidelines and also in the application document as well. I saw another one again asking about applying more than the eligibility amount, and the answer is no. See the uh, question down. I'm going down. Okay. So. I am not seeing it here in, so you said it's in the chat? Yeah, I, I pasted it back in the chat. This could be from me. So I'll tell us and if you can just let me okay. to send it to you. Yeah, like. 
given that summer programs you mentioned early in the meeting as eligible activities, if the district offers summer programs, can MB funds be used for McKinney Vento students who do not qualify for the district's summer programs? So yes, so a great example of that would be summer school. So we know that there are some students that are required to attend summer school due to uh, not passing their STAR assessments and their course assessments. But you can utilize your grant funds to help pay for summer school for acceleration or to help with any type of credit repair or recovery services. This would be an allowable use of funds. Okay, so Monica, I know we're coming up here at our hour. Um, I did wanna share with everybody that was on today that if we did not get to your question, we will be um, incorporating them to the FAQ document. Um, and so we will move forward with that. If they're similar, we will combine them. Um, I'm just looking at any other ones before we go ahead and wrap up. Um, there is a question that says, is it better to apply as an individual LEA or as an SSA? And that is a local decision that needs to be assessed and determined. Um, there's questions that say, may funds be used for dental support for undocumented homeless students? And if you look at the allowable use of funds, it's only for referrals for services, not for actually paying for the medical services. So that would be no. Um, School uniform scout, can you uh, I see that in a couple of places. Okay. And then there's also a question about, is there a limit to the percentage of the total grant that can be used for personnel to directly intervene with homeless children and youth? We did not stipulate that, but if you do have a large percentage, right, you have to clearly articulate what are the roles and duties and programs that those staff members will be responsible for and what are the anticipated outcomes. Um, can we purchase billboards or other media for outreach with grant funds? And the answer would be no. Um, so a great question provided by one of the ESCs when we talk about submit um, the local board policy regarding dispute resolution. This uh, for, for ESCs that have shared service arrangements you would need to provide, ask your member districts to provide that information. So for member districts, they would need to provide whether or not they have the local board policy, um, provide that documentation and any attachments. That would be specific for the member districts to provide that as part of the application. And so there's also, again, I'm gonna redirect everyone to the timelines. The timelines quickly show uh, when the evaluate when the reviews will be going, the deadline, and when the anticipated award will also be provided. Um, that is in the timeline and also can be found on the TA grants opportunities page. I also wanted to direct that uh, laundry detergent and laundry appliances are unallowable use of funds. I'm going to redirect everyone to please go back to the unallowable use of funds. And it is indicated there that appliances are an unallowable use of funds. And so that would not, you would not be able to use grant funds for that. Another great question is can other LEAs join the SSA after the application due date? And the answer would be no. All LEAs that are going to be part of an ESC SSA application have to be submitted at the initial application. They cannot join during year two or year three. And I wanted to share that there are no pre-award costs allowed. And I think that's about it. I think we've covered a majority of the questions. Monica, is there anything else you see? Uh, did you address Uniforms, school uniforms. Yes, school uniforms. We consider those to be school supplies because they are necessary for the students to attend. We just stress that you try to utilize any other community resources for that. At times, a lot of the vendors do provide some uniforms to the schools and districts for free. And so we encourage you to prioritize homeless students for that. But yes, if families are needing assistance, 
funds could be used to purchase one or two school uniforms. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for everybody who joined us today. Again, we, this presentation has been recorded and will be posted on the TEA Grants Opportunities page. And we anticipate that the posting by mid of next week. And we just highly encourage everyone to submit any additional questions through the FAQ process. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.